Climate Week NYC is getting it done. So, ready to think big? And graphics, go. Hello everyone and welcome back to the new climate reality, energy certainty in an uncertain world. As the world faces the biggest energy crisis of the century, creating access to clean, affordable and reliable energy in resilient systems must become a priority. I'm sure many of you will join me in being increasingly concerned by reports from all over the globe of leaders seeking to find or extract new fossil fuels as an answer to the energy crisis. There's just no way to do this, and as we all committed to at COP26, keep 1.5 alive. I think it's also really important to highlight that the energy crisis the world is facing was an issue before the illegal invasion of Ukraine. While that has certainly exacerbated the problem, we were already heading towards a crisis. We need to commit to drastic measures for both the long and short term to really grasp the issue, and those will look different in different countries. So how can the world double down on clean energy strategies to meet demand, deliver security of supply, and build energy independence? And how can we deliver short-term solutions to addressing the current crises without turning on the taps for fossil fuels and undermining our long-term goals? And rather than just saying what governments shouldn't be doing, what should they be doing? We want this event to be a place of solutions and ambition. So joining me first on stage to discuss this are COP26 President Alok Sharma and the Minister of Energy Transition and Sustainable Development for Morocco, Dr. Leila Banani. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining me. And let's just get straight into the issue. Um, how has the war in Ukraine shaped our ability to respond to climate change? And is our global response pushing us past that 1.5 degree target? Uh, President, COP26. Um, thank you very much, Helen. So I, I think um, yeah, t two things uh, have happened. One is uh, we've got an energy security crisis as a result of this, this legal war. And um, you know, every government is looking to make sure that um, they've got sufficient energy, particularly through this winter, to get through, to keep lights on. I can tell you, you know, sitting in, in, in any government, uh, that's, you need to make sure that, that factories are running. Uh, and so you, you see that response. And yes, there are countries which are using more coal, uh, that are using more fossil fuels. Uh, and, and yes, uh, you know, looking at uh, extracting uh, more of what is uh, where, where they're already uh, in a fields uh, which are being, being used. But the other sort of side of the response has also been for countries to very clearly set out plans to accelerate their own clean energy transition. I mean, we've done that in the UK. We're seeing that around the world, in the EU, in individual EU countries as well. So, I mean, th this point is that, is our global response pushing us past the 1.5 target? Uh, I'm an optimist, uh, and my optimism tells me that actually we will probably see a faster uh, clean energy transition across the world as a result of this war. Uh, but, um, you know, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be tough in the short term. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Ellen, um, and i um, happy to share the stage again with uh, uh, Mr. Alok Sharma, uh, one year after COP26 in Glasgow, indeed. Um, I think there's, if there's one thing that the Ukraine war has taught us is, um, is the importance, I mean, the technical answer would be the importance of a diversified energy mix, the importance of renewables, uh, importance of uh, the grid, of strengthening the grid, either centralized or decentralized. And I think uh, the need to accelerate the energy transition. But there are, I think, two other things that this war has taught us. First is uh, the importance of building resilience and restoring trust. Trust, I think, has been lost. Uh, trust between politicians and populations, trust with, within uh, countries, uh, trust uh, with central bankers who are who might be increasing interest rates as we go, so I think there are a lot of learnings that we can have from from the war. Um, we are indeed under increasing pressures to face the twin challenges, um, but there are also some unbearable trade-offs that we really have to be conscious about. And as I was telling uh, Alok a bit early on, there is nothing short-term about policy. So whatever short-term decision we make stays with us for a few years. Yeah. So, you know, Europe's response to these energy crises at the moment seems to be like replacing one gas source with another. And even last year at Climate Week, 
uh, before this started, we were talking about you know, this kind of one last coal mine thing of like, we've, we're committed to renewables, but we'll just do one last little coal mine over here and then we'll get there. What's stopping us from, from doubling down? And, and, and you know, we're we missing an opportunity now to really accelerate this transition. So um, I, I agree with Leila that I would be the voice of optimism and reason uh, on this panel. <laughs> um, and uh, she's going to give the tough messages. But actually, I mean, just if you have a look at some of the stats that have come out recently, um, the amount of new energy capacity being installed across the world, the vast majority of that, about sort of 75% plus, is renewables. Mm. So, I mean, this stuff is, is happening. And, you know, if I think about the UK, we, we set out uh, something called our British Energy Security Strategy. We've got a huge offshore wind sector. We want to quintuple that five times in size by 2030. And the private sector is up for this. You know, five times as much of, of solar as we've got, more nuclear. So I think, um, you know, th th there is, there is a, a, a cause for, for hope in this. But I make this, this, this point about, um, uh, and you know, you're referring to, uh, you know, one more coal mine, uh, you know, some new licenses. Th the reality is that if you are a private sector investor, putting money into this, you need to think really very carefully whether you're going to end up with stranded assets. You're not, you're not going to extract this stuff out of the ground in a matter of year, two years. You're making a long-term play. And so, you know, my message to private sector investors is think very carefully when you make investments and look at the price of renewables and how that is dropped and how quickly you can get that stuff up across the world. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Benali, Africa's facing a really different challenge from Europe, of course, when it comes to energy security and the current crisis. But the region and, you know, Morocco has this potential to play a hugely leading role um, as the energy world's transition to, to net zero, so wind, uh, solar and so on. Do you think greater investment in renewable power and more support for the region is a viable solution uh, to the energy crisis? Well, I think you said it yourself, uh, Ellen. There is, there is no contradiction between increasing, ramping up renewables and winning the energy, the energy transition uh, challenge. And I think on Africa, I mean, you mentioned Africa, there are a few data that we're all uh, aware of, um, access to energy, we have half a billion people. I mean, we can disagree on the 580 million or 620, it doesn't matter. It's more than 70% of the continent doesn't have access to electricity. To energy, it's not. These are not people who are hesitating between switching on their washing machine at 7 p.m. to take advantage of the off-peak mm. uh, power rates. They just don't have a washing machine. <laughs> I mean, that's that's how that's what we are talking about. Um, we need to deploy gigawatts of, of renewables. Uh, in Africa to sort out uh, the access issue. But to get back to the er earlier issue of coal, I remember last year, Glasgow, uh, freshly nominated minister of energy transition and sustainable development and environment and energy and mining, schizophrenic minister. <laughs> <laughs> Very long business card. <laughs> <laughs> and um, here you go. We are, Morocco is part of the alliance powering past coal, no new coal plants, but we didn't have natural gas in our system that morning on the 1st of November of 2021. And I remember when I met Alok, when I met a few other people, I said, well, can we use Ukraine as a benchmark? Because Ukraine reversed some pipelines to diversify its supply away from Russia. This was last year. We used, I never thought that history would prove us mm. right, that we can we can actually win this energy transition, ramping up renewables, making sure that natural gas has its right role in the system. And of course, then we can definitely power past coal and admit that we will, we will swear that we'll not be at any new coal plant. Yeah, and, and I think one thing on that is, you know, I, I agree with you actually on the, on the investor front, but it, it worries me we have to, you know, have this situation where policymakers are saying fine, and that we're all hoping that no one makes the business case. And I, I do think that will be the case for a lot of these things that, you know, you can't get the investment. But how do we stop policymakers backsliding on their the commitments? I can see the temptation and then the hope, but you know, how do we stop that? Uh, and what would you like to see from governments and policymakers? Well, so I mean, in terms of backsliding, uh, you know, I, I, I said this in an uh, earlier event today, which is that. Um, I was at the, the G20 Climate, Energy and Environment Ministers meeting in Indonesia a, a few weeks ago, 
uh, and frankly, there was backsliding. There was backsliding from some of the biggest emitters. Uh, actually, the, the same folks who are facing some of the biggest challenges when it comes to the environment, and yet they were backsliding on language that we agreed in Glasgow. Mm. Some, there was even some backsliding on what was agreed in Paris. I mean, it, to me, that is completely unacceptable. That is really completely unacceptable. So you are, you are, you are seeing this, this, uh, this temptation. But uh, I mean, I think g going to this point about how do you support? So one thing is, you know, how do developed countries, uh, you know, push forward? Um, the other is, how do you support developing nations? And I think this, this comes back to this point about these just energy transition mm -hmm. partnerships that we've talked about before. Um, there's one for South Africa. Um, there are others that we are discussing for, for uh, Senegal, for Vietnam, for Indonesia and India. And I hope we can announce some of these uh, in more formally when we come to, to COP27. But that's what needs to happen, is developed countries, the MDBs, the private sector, needs to support many of these developing countries to make that, that change. I mean, this is all about money at the end of the day. Mm. And, and uh, you know, I, I have a sympathy when, uh, you know, countries will say, we want to do the right thing, but we need the financing to make yeah. it happen. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I fully relate. And I think today, South-South cooperation has, has worked in, in many times. I mean, I'm thinking of some of the initiatives that we have partnered, for example, with Ethiopia, on the African Coalition for Sustainable Energy Access, um, the Blue Fund for the Congo Basin, uh, it, I mean, UNEA, the presidency of uh, United Nations Environment Assembly. And I think at this stage, finance is available. It's misplaced. It's not at the right place. And I don't think um, the government can do, it, do that alone or the MDBs or the financial sector and the private sector. I think everybody's sort of aware uh, what is missing now is integrating all these issues. And I'm, I'm again, uh, I cannot, as, uh, as a schizophrenic minister, mm -hmm. uh, just hold the, the torch of climate versus the environment, versus biodiversity loss, versus nature, and versus human life. Because as long as we don't bring those, uh, I would say, three aspects, climate and nature and human development back into the equation, I don't think we would have done a great job in being uh, fulfilling the Paris pledges, let alone the Glasgow pledges. Great. Now, I said we would talk about what we do want, not just the kind of what we don't want side. And, and we, obviously, we've got to build out renewable energy and clean infrastructure. But, you know, the cost of that is high at the moment. We've been talking about, about money, but we're seeing energy companies making these vast profits. What do we need, what do we need to change to kind of change the dynamics? Of, of clean energy and get that reflected on the global market. Minister, do you want to? For me? Yeah. All right. Um, well, I think there are two critical issues that we need to, uh, to address um, objectively and uh, with, with a lot of courage. The first, I think, issue is misplaced subsidies and incentives. Uh, I think it's quite critical to see that the financial sector, the financial sector, and uh, the private sector can uh, create a lot of innovation bubbles, and we've seen that in renewables. I mean, cost of renewables, and especially if solar PV, have declined dramatically over the last 10 to 12 years. But we didn't see that uh, being reflected uh, in the overall energy bill of the countries. And uh, Kingdom of Morocco is a very good example of that. Um, so I think there is something there that needs to be done, and I think the second. Uh, aspect is also mispricing externalities, whether positive or negative externalities. And that's why it's quite important to make sure that we, that we tackle those two issues um, with courage and transparency. Because at the end of the day, we can have all the data in the world as long as we don't uh, make that da data transparent. Uh, it will be very difficult to address those two issues that I'm mentioning. Uh, you said, I mean, look, I, I uh, you know, you, you will know that uh, uh, there are a number of big oil and gas companies that have talked about uh, becoming sort of, you know, energy companies making that transition. Um, you can have a look at the numbers and see, you know, whether they are actually making this investment or not. I mean, what I would quite like to see is for governments uh, and shareholders particularly to say to these companies, okay, tell us, you know, not what you're going to do by 2030, mm -hmm. tell us the next quarter, the next half the year, next quarter after that. How are you going to invest in a clean energy transition? Um, and, you know, Leila talked about transparency. That's what we need to see. And I think there is a real opportunity here for uh, shareholders and institutions which you know, have signed up to a, a, a green transition to basically push these companies to set out 
very clearly what their plans are. Great. And so just one final quick question for you both. We're just weeks away from COP27. I'm sure you've got, you probably know to the day or the hour how far away we are. Um, what's, if we can deliver one thing in Sharm, what would it be? Let's, let's start. Uh, one, one thing, yeah. right. <laughs> uh, well, two things. OK, you can have two. <laughs> well, yeah. one, one thing would be restoring trust and credibility. Yeah. I, think, I, I think we lost trust, we lost credibility, both, both in multilateral climate agreements and uh, between, between nations and states. You have half of humanity today that is at risk of either floods or drought or uh, every, every type of disasters that you can think of. That's half of humanity. I was hoping that after the pandemic, after two years of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, um, we should be using those common crises uh, that we faced in the last three years as an opportunity to bring us together and bring again, as I said, climate, nature, and human development under the same roof, holistic roof, holistic and integrated solutions. Great, thank you. I'm sure your list is much longer than one, but give us some. Well, no, I can give you one. <laughs> That's what you asked for. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, I talked about these just energy transition partnerships. Actually, what I, and since we're talking about energy, that's what I would like to happen, mm. is that these additional JetPs that we have announced, that the G7 and others are working together uh, with uh, developing nations on, can be announced as formal political declarations. And I hope the other thing that will happen, uh, if, if uh, you know, people and governments don't already realize this, for us all to spread the message that actually environmental security is uh, interlinked with energy security and also national security, Absolutely. right? These three are totally linked. And that's one thing I think uh, this uh, Putin's illegal invasion has shown us. And we need to get that message loud and clear. If you want to have energy security, invest in homegrown renewables and clean energy. Fantastic. Thank you. Please join me in thanking the speakers and also wishing uh, the COP president really well in your last few weeks. <laughs> Thank you. So with that, we're now going to move on to our final plenary panel. Um, we're going to really dive into the clean energy transition. Are we going to seize this opportunity or let it slip? Um, so I'm going to ask uh, the minister to move along here, and then we're going to ask my other panellists to say. So we have Will Hazelip, President for National Grid Ventures, uh, Bill Strohek, for Country Manager Director in Canada for Hitachi, and Her Excellency Dr. Nawal Al-Hassani, Renewable